And it's not about finding the happy ever after story. It's recognizing that as we journey through life, we're traversing pain and joy at the same time. And God meets us in both. He can transform something terrible into something wonderful. Suffering is never for nothing. You're already part of the resurrection if you're believers. This is the perspective we need to have that separates us from the hopeless perspective. The day you become a Christian, the life I now live in the body, I live by faith. Sometimes we get so concerned about where we'll be tomorrow or where we'll be next week or where we'll be next year. No, the perspective of the Christian is where we're going to be in 100,000 years. What we're pursuing is contentment and peace understanding that God is at work in ways that we can't even imagine. And he is doing things that maybe we will never fully understand this side of heaven. And yet we trust him. The title of my talk Uh, this morning is grief and the mission of God. Obviously, I'm not going to be able to go into all all the things contained in a a book or anything else I've written uh, on grief, but I wanted to really address a few things this morning because I feel that we're living in a time where people are really asking a lot of questions around suffering, around loss, around pain, and perhaps more than any era in history, we're more aware of people suffering uh, and, and having to grapple with pain and death than in any other era in history, just because we have so much access uh, in the news and on social media. And I feel it's an important message and something we should be talking about in church for three reasons. Firstly, in a room like this, there will be people grieving. There will be people going through deep loss. And we can, you bring that with you. We can't leave it at the door when we come into church. We bring that with us. And so it's important that we speak about it and we address it. And for anyone going through difficult circumstances right now, I want you to know I've been praying for you this morning as we come into this service that God will minister into your hearts. I don't have answers, all the answers, but I do have something that I hope will encourage you uh, this morning. But even if you're not in that place right now, there's also a second group of people who will definitely have experienced grief and trauma in the past. And and sometimes we struggle to actually deal. Maybe we've not really dealt with the trauma uh, that's gone on in our past. The U2 frontman, Bono, he says he's convinced um, that the most traumatic events uh, can cause us to get stuck in our lives. And maybe some of us have been or experienced great trauma and really we got stuck there. And we're struggling to move through that place. But there's a third group of people. If you're not in that first or second group, there's a third group here this morning. And those are people who are going to face stuff. (laughs) The stuff that is going to happen. Even our own sense of mortality. Death is a part of life. It's It's a reality we have to face. And so even though this morning I'm talking mostly within the context of grief and loss having walked this journey myself since my first wife died in 2016, I'm using that as the framework. I also want to recognize that death isn't the only grief, is it? There's the loss of a job, loss of opportunity, there's divorce, there's decisions our children are making, there's all kinds of things going on in the world that cause us pain and loss just by being part of the human race. So it's important we talk about this. It's relevant to all of us. Yet I think it's also important for our testimony to the world. I think the world is looking at us as believers and saying, do we really have a different perspective when it comes to matters of life and death? And so as our testimony, as we walk through the valley of shadow of death ourselves, how are we doing that in such a way that still points people to Jesus, the ultimate hope? And I also talk about this not just because of my own experience, But I recognize that it's something we're finding difficult to talk about. Death is a taboo topic. It can be quite heavy. It can be quite somber. And yet we need to address it. I've been saying this as I've been speaking recently. We can't just wait for funerals before we talk about death. By the time we're in the funeral, 
It's actually too late. We're not in the right state of mind to hear what the Bible speaks about these things. Similarly, when a couple get married and the preacher gets up and starts talking to them about their marriage, I think it's too late. <laughs> the deal has been done. Um, so, so, so we need to prepare for these things biblically and scripturally. And so there should be no topic off limits. And I know this is a church. I listen to, I listen to your podcasts. This is a church that deals with the tough stuff. Uh, and so I want to address that this morning. So there are three points so you can track me, track with me uh, this morning. Uh, the first point we're going to see is that Christians are not immune from pain. Um, and the, and the, the, the stuff of life is something that we all are going to face. So we're going to focus a little bit on the bad news. But then we're going to have two points of good news. One is that God does redeem pain. But also that God is the great resurrector. He is the one that brings life from death. So we're going to read from Acts chapter 8. Of all the passages in, in the scriptures about matters of life and death, this is one that has really struck me recently and often one, even when Gareth actually reviewed my book, and, and I wrote on this verse, he said, oh, I've never seen that before. So I said to him last night, well, if Gareth, you never saw that before, maybe there'll be some others that haven't quite seen this before. I'm only going to read a few verses uh, from Acts chapter 8, starting halfway through verse 1 uh, to verse 3. Let's just pray as we turn to the word. Lord, just still our hearts. We pray. We breathe. We breathe in of your Holy Spirit. We breathe out of all anxiety and stress in order that we can breathe in again of your spirit so as we turn to your word you can minister to our souls we pray in jesus name amen Amen. on that day a great persecution broke out against the church in jerusalem and all except the apostles were scattered throughout judea and samaria godly men buried stephen and mourned deeply for him But Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. My key text for us today is verse 2. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. Let's just consider what's happening here. In chapters 6 and 7 of Acts, we're introduced to this young man called Stephen. Any Stephens in the house this morning? Yes, okay, a couple of Stephens, popular name, and and for good reason. Stephen was the rising star of the church, of the New Testament church. When the apostles were looking to raise leaders, they appointed deacons, and Stephen was one of them. In fact, in Acts 6 verse 8, it has this incredible commendation about Stephen. It says, now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Stephen was all in for the gospel and he had an amazing future. You know, if he was around today, he would be the one of the ones that we'd be talking about and saying, have you read his books? Have you listened to his podcast? Are you seeing what he's doing for the kingdom of God? He was the rising star. But because he was that and because he was so committed to Christ, um, there began to be opposition against him. He was seized by the Sanhedrin. And they began to do false accusations, saying that he was denying, effectively denying the Old Testament and the continuity of the gospel. And they tried to, they were wanting to silence him. They brought false witnesses against him in a a, a public kangaroo court in order to try uh, and silence him. Stephen would not be silenced. And chapter 7 is his sermon in defense of the gospel of Jesus Christ. A brilliant summary of the Old Testament where he demonstrated that he was not denying the truth of the Old Testament, but rather showing that Jesus was the fulfillment, very much to what Pastor Will shared with us earlier this morning. He was saying there's a continuity between the old and new. In fact, life is only uh, meaningful and purposeful in in that the Old Testament has been fulfilled by Jesus Christ. And as the, as the crowd got more angry, he was quite robust in his defense. Go and read it this afternoon after your Sunday lunch. And you'll see Stephen was quite robust in his defense of the gospel. Interestingly, though, as he, they began to, just like the, his, the, the man he followed, Jesus Christ, 
that the religious leaders began to accuse him of blasphemy. And they took him out of the city and they picked up stones and they took him. And as Stephen himself was having a vision of Jesus, they began to hurl their stones on top of their insults in order to silence him. And ultimately, they killed him. The rising star in the early church was murdered in his prime. And his last words were just similar to, again, to his saviour. He said, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Isn't it interesting? God did not intervene. Stephen was killed. And so we are reminded that none of us are immune from suffering. Sometimes God intervenes. Sometimes he doesn't. He is sovereign in his decisions and he knows best. Ultimately, the call is to continue trusting in him, even when things don't make sense to us. This was a game-changing moment for the early church. In, the, the, the religious leaders were trying to silence them. They lost one of their best leaders and persecution broke out. Suddenly no one was safe. Men and women were not safe in Jerusalem. It was destabilizing and it must have been confusing. How did they respond? Well, when this passage is typically preached upon Acts chapter 8, it talks about how God used the martyrdom of Stephen in order to see the gospel spread from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and ultimately to the ends of the world. That's the mission of God, yeah? We know that. The great commission of Christ. That is it. And yet, intriguingly, before we get there, there's this one verse that says this. Godly men. I believe they were Stephen's mates. It says they buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. The New King James Version says this, and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. I think it's, it's fascinating and very important for us to note that even in the life of the early church, they mourned the loss of a loved one. They didn't go straight from the, 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 the persecution, oh, we're being persecuted, we're going to scatter, and we're going to go everywhere and tell about Jesus. That happened. But, in, but they took moment, an important moment, to grieve the loss of their loved one. And I think the challenge for us as Christians is sometimes there are two equal and opposite mistakes that we make as we deal with grief and loss. One of them is we over-spiritualize it. And as Christians, we say, we, 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 we kind of pretend we're immune to it. And we come into church with our smiling face and our Christian cliches. But inside, we know there's a brokenness when we're facing loss. We can't over-spiritualize. We can't super-spiritualize because, as we will see, that's not what the Bible does. But the other danger is this. Because when we, over, well, the first danger, if we over-spiritualize, is we never allow God to minister to us in our pain. And God wants to minister to us right where we're at, in our, lam in our lam lamenting. But the second danger we have is that actually we begin to question God and we get on the verge of even losing our faith. Maybe some of us know that. We say, oh, if there's a good God, why has this happened to me? And we tend to move away from God and lose our trust and faith in him rather than moving towards him. I think the Bible is not in either of these camps. I think the Bible is somewhere in between where yes, there is a spiritual response that we can make to loss and grief, but there's also a reality of lamenting. There's a reality of grief that as, as human beings made in the image of God, not intended for death, there's a lament that we need to make. And I would say right through scriptures we see this. Some people might think, well, surely lamenting and grief that was part of the Old Testament. We see it in the Psalms, don't we? We see it in Job. We see it in Jeremiah. A lot of lamenting. And often when, we, when we're at funerals and, and, and the such, it's those scriptures we turn to. And that's fine because those were real life people facing real life problems 
um, and challenge us. But sometimes in the super spiritual uh, um, uh, kind of arm of the church, they, they say, no, that's Old Testament. New Testament is all about resurrection and life. But then we're reminded about Jesus, aren't we? When he went to his good mate, Lazarus, and wept with Martha and Mary. We saw that Jesus did lament throughout his life for the, for the, for the, the consequences of sin and death. But then someone might say, but that was still pre-resurrection. So what I love about this passage that we had with Stephen is post-resurrection. The post-resurrection believers model for us that it is appropriate to lament the loss of loved ones. Not just appropriate, it's actually part of the process of life that God has for us. I think that's why this is an incredible gem of a verse. So even though his friends had absolute assurance of where Stephen had got. Stephen, even as they're pelting stones at him, had a vision of the resurrected Jesus after all. But they didn't turn around and say, oh, praise God, Stephen's with Jesus. He's with his friend in heaven. He had the vision, just stepped. Oh, praise, hallelujah, that they pelted stones. Praise the Lord that one day we'll see our friend again in heaven. That's not the reality, though, is it? There was a pain in their heart, and they had great lamentation over him. Let's underline what we're seeing here. Godly people will suffer. We are not immune. And godly people impacted by suffering should lament. We should allow ourselves the grace in order to process grief in a godly way. Lament is, and actually Gareth recommended this book to me. Lament is the honest cry of a hurting heart wrestling with the paradox of pain and the promise of God's goodness. Lament stands in the gap between pain and promise. Lament is a prayer in pain that leads to trust. You see that? Lament is a prayer in pain that leads to trust. Lament is a path to praise as we are led through our brokenness and disappointment. The mission of God is to see us restored to him in praise. Sometimes the pathway to that is through the difficult road of lamenting our grief in the presence of God so that our trust can be restored in him. But the New Testament also tells us this, and we hold this in tension, don't we? Uh, It's important that we do not mourn without hope. We are not like the world that doesn't have hope. In our lamenting, our lamenting should be leading us to hope because 1 Thessalonians 4.13 says, uh, brothers and sisters, do We do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Elsewhere, Paul has said, we mourn with those who mourn. So it's important, again, that we we, we, we allow that time and space for mourning, but we do not mourn like those without hope. So what does this mean? Well, having acknowledged that Christians are not immune from pain, suffering, and should grieve and lament when facing death and loss. I want us now to point us back to the good news. Uh, Having spent some time, maybe even affirming you where you are at right now and saying it's fine. The the tension or or stress you're feeling because you think you should be happy because you're a Christian and yet you're facing deep loss. God can meet you in that place. And yet there are some promises for you. And the first promise is this. God redeems our pain. He is the one who wants to turn the bad news into good news. He can meet us where we're at and turn our situation around. And as Christians, we should have this expectation. Pete Gregg wrote the following, as a common human tendency to settle in our grief. It is on the screen. To redefine the geography of our lives according to the contours of our pain. Oh, maybe it's not on the screen, sorry. No, it's not. Sorry. Thank you. My apologies. <laughs> uh, and of course, when we are bereaved and hurting, it's important to stop for a while and lament our loss. It's not healthy to continue as if nothing is wrong, but neither is it, a, is it healthy to make disappointment our permanent domain. And when I went through the loss of my first wife, Laura, in 2016, there was a time, months and months, of deep grief that I went through. Nothing had prepared me for that. I talked about facing the future. I didn't choose. 
And at that moment, I had to make a daily choice every second, every minute to keep on trusting in God, even though I was confused and hurt and broken. I, wrote, I did write my first book before uh, Finding Life After Death, and it is on the stand uh, called Grief and Grace. And I went through this six month process of saying, Lord, I'm completely confused. <laughs> and, and on the other side of that, recognize that grief is not something you simply get over, but continue to journey through. But as I begin, continue to journey through it, I began to see God was redeeming things moment by moment. Even being able to share with you something of my story is part of God's redemption plan for my life. I find healing in the fact that over the past six or eight years or so, I've spoken to probably dozens and dozens, maybe in the hundreds of people who've gone through grief and loss and been able to point them towards hope and healing in Jesus Christ. And it's not about finding the happy ever after story. It's recognizing that as we journey through life, we're traversing pain and joy at the same time. And God meets us in both. God meets us. He's there for us in both. That's his redemption plan for us. God does bring good out of bad. And, and if we read on to verse 4 of, of chapter 8, we start to see his redemption plan right here in Acts. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went wherever they went, having gone through this deep grief and loss and even going out there in their pain and the confusion, they continue to preach the word. And as they did so, we see Philip uh, seeing great miracles in Samaria. We see Philip uh, 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 going on and preaching the gospel to an Ethiopian and we hear the gospel coming to Africa. So so we see this line from the grief to the mission of God being fulfilled. And Any Africans in the house? We trace it right back here to Acts chapter 4. In Ethiop- an Ethiopian eunuch bringing the gospel into Africa. Praise the Lord. It doesn't mean that they had all the answers to why Stephen had, had to die, but now they're beginning to see God's redemption plan at work. And this is the work of the gospel. In Isaiah 61 verse 1, he says, he will take, uh, uh, he will take out ashes and he will bring them into beauty. That's his job of restoration. He is the one that brings beauty out of ashes. He is the redeeming God. Elizabeth Elliot was someone who was familiar with suffering, married to Jim Elliot, the missionary who was killed by Orca Indians uh, back in the mid-20th century. Her first husband was murdered on the mission field while she had a young baby. She then remarried a few years later, and her second husband died after, after five years of marriage to cancer. She's had, she suffered in multiple ways, and she wrote a book uh, entitled Suffering is Never for Nothing. A line in this book that it, says this, it's through the deepest suffering that God has taught me the deepest lessons. He has a loving purpose, and he can transform something terrible into something wonderful. Do you believe that this morning? He can transform something terrible into into something wonderful. Suffering is never for nothing. Suffering is never for nothing. However, just because we can and understand and even discern God's purpose at work in pain and grief, that this doesn't mean we'll immediately be happy. That's what the world thinks we're, we're pursuing. No, what we're pursuing is contentment and peace, understanding that God is at work in ways that we can't even imagine. And he is doing things that maybe we will never fully understand this side of heaven. And yet we trust him because we see it in the lives of that, the testimony of thousands of millions of Christians throughout history. When we cling on to him, he will not let go because he is the one clinging on to us. A friend of mine going through grief, she said, she said this and wrote in a journal. I had to learn to take hold of the hand of the one who had taken hold of me. That's the journey. And when we do that, we begin to see God redeem it. But I thought I I want to take it a step further because there's a reason we have this absolute assurance that God can turn uh, bad situations into good for his glory. It's because of this. It's because we have a resurrection perspective. And we've celebrated it this morning. We believe that, that life in Christ conquers death, ultimately. So God resurrects our hope. Not only does God redeem by bringing good out of bad, God also resurrects by bringing life from death. 
I believe that, that, um, that defeating death is at the center of the mission of God. That's why we have the scriptures. We have, we have the first three chapters telling us how God intended it to be. And then we have the rest of the scripture describing how God has, 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 has been working in human history to overcome the consequences of sin and death. That is his mission. But also within his mission, within the mission of God, we see that, that God himself grieves over death. And that's why I believe when Jesus was on the cross, and this is something that ministered deeply within my soul when I was going through deep grief, when Jesus was on the cross, it went dark, didn't it? And for the first time, uh, I, I said to God, I said, now I understand why you switched out the lights when Jesus, when Jesus died. It's because that was the grief of heaven, <laughs> uh, 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 turning out the lights, because no, because you could not live in light anymore with, when, when the Son of Jesus, when the Son of God died. And yet, three days later, the lights were switched back on. On the third day, when Jesus came back to life and conquered sin and death for all time, that is the resurrection hope that we have. And the brilliant thing about us as Christians is that we understand we've already died. When we became a Christian, that was the day we died. It was the day Tim Tucker died, was the day I became a Christian as a young person. And I know the Bible says, I no longer live, but he lives with me. Galatians 2 verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And when does that happen? Does that happen the day we die? No, it happens the day we die to sin. You're already part of the resurrection if you're believers. This is the perspective we need to have that separates us from the hopeless perspective. The day you become a Christian, the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The life I now live in the body is a life of, 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 as a life of faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm already living as a kingdom citizen. So what's the worst the world can, and the devil can do to me? Because even if they take this life, I'm already living this life thinking about where I'm going to be in 10,000 years' time. Sometimes we get so concerned about where we'll be tomorrow or where we'll be next week or where we'll be next year. No, the perspective of the Christian is where we're going to be in 100,000 years. We're going to be alive in his presence. And so our momentary and light sufferings need to be seen in that light because that's the light that brings us hope. It doesn't mean you're not in pain. We've already covered that this morning we've already said God wants to minister into us pain why he wants to minister minister to us in our pain why because he has eternity in mind for us and he has a perfect destiny for us that he wants us to glimpse in this life as we hold on to him in hope and we see this beautifully I love this where this section of Acts finishes Acts chapter 9 verse 31 and we're coming into land now and I'd love to pray for some of us then Christine is going to sing another song but Acts 9 verse 31 says this, Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, God had redeemed, but now he also resurrects hopes. He says, Enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. And I believe that God has a destiny for you, a destination for you that will bring you a time of peace where he can continue to strengthen you and where even in your pain there will be a fruitfulness a ministry that you would never have imagined because he is doing something deep within you why can we be assured of that we can be assured of that because of the resurrection of jesus christ who has this who has defeated sin and death on the cross and brought you into a new and living hope amen if you're able, would you like to stand with me? I'd just like to pray for us. So we've seen this morning these, these three truths that we hold in tension, that we're not immune from pain. And I understand there are those here this morning going through some difficult times. And I'd love to pray for you. I'd love to pray for you that in wherever you're at right now, you will once again know the peace of Christ to a deeper level, that he loves you and that he has a perfect plan and purpose for your life right where you're at. Some of you are holding on for that redemption. You're saying, 
when is the good going to come out of this bad situation? And our message to you is just keep holding on in hope. Keep trusting. Even as you lament, let your lament take you to that place of trust and even praise of God because he is at work. And why can we praise? Because ultimately we're looking to Jesus. Jesus, the one who defeated sin and death. And so wherever you're at this morning, I'm just going to take a moment of silence and maybe just as a, as a, a sign of receiving from the Lord, you just want to put your hands out in front of you, right where you're at. And I just want to take a moment of silence and wherever you're at, just lay that before the Lord right now. If it's a lament, bring it before God. If it's so uh, you need your situation redeemed, just lay it, lay it to the foot of the cross. Maybe you're someone who's never fully surrendered your life to Jesus. Why not this morning recommit your life or fully surrender your life to Jesus? He can, he can take your death and bring you into life. Just allow the Spirit of God to minister to your heart. Lord Jesus, whenever you're at work is a holy moment. And we say this is a holy moment now. May you minister deep within our souls, my brothers and sisters in this room. I pray, God of all compassion, God of all mercy, you are so kind and gentle with us. I pray, Father, that you will restore our hope where we've lost hope, that you will redeem our situation, that you will bring good from the bad. Whatever that is, we lay it before you now. And we trust, we trust in you because you are a good and faithful God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. If anyone wants further prayer afterwards, I'm sure you, as we said at communion, you can come to the front and the ministry team here, the elders will pray with you and you can share with them as much or as little. One thing I failed to mention in my, in my talk is we have to do this as community. If you're going through pain, don't isolate yourself. Come together as the body of Christ and stand together so we can mourn with those who mourn just as we rejoice with those who rejoice. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be yours both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.